All right. So good morning, good evening, good afternoon, uh, based on where you are at. And welcome to our CloudOps cohort, yet another session. And um, this time, I'm I'm trying to bring in a new formula where we kind of just focus on the projects as part of this cohort. And formally, we, we are building products, but we just want to create that formal structure where we take up, uh, divide these missions each week into a mission. And for each mission, there could be one or more projects. So what is the mission for this week? This week, we're going to do some really interesting, also complex, and kind of a, a ninja level stuff. And this kind of these kind of projects would really help you uh, become a real uh, DevOps engineer or a DevOps ninja, you can call it. And uh, what are we doing here? We're going to focus on setting up a NAT server, uh, but this time custom, not like the one which is given by AWS. This will help you dive deeper into Linux networking and security a little bit. Uh, configure SSH multi-hop connection, uh, create SSH tunneling, and also set up Nginx as a reverse proxy. I hope that kind of, you find that exciting also. And then later on, I uh, plan to also, you know, kind of edit this recording into this project specific thing so that you can just go and look at the solution for each of the project in one of the recordings. That is the idea. So uh, let me also see what else we can enable in terms of the show meetings. All right. Okay. Uh, there was an option to take an AI-based meeting, uh, AI companion, and uh, start summary. All right. That's what I was looking for. So it gives me a text summary, which I can publish also possibly. So in today's session, we are going to build these four projects. I'm going to demonstrate how to do that. And then I'll, uh, based on that, watching the recordings and the supporting documents, you should be able to uh, build these projects as well. So what do we have so far and uh, how are we going to go about it with this session? Uh, let me explain to you visually uh, first and then we'll start diving into the first project right away. So good evening, everyone, um, whoever I've not mentioned. So uh, welcome everyone, good evening. And I hope you guys are all doing fine. And this is where we stand right now. So as far as the last three missions are concerned, we looked at how to create the VPC, uh, deploy the front-end application and the back-end service as well. And this is what we did, created a VPC, designed a VPC, with uh, within one particular region of AWS, that is Northern California, created four subnets, two public and two private uh, in two different availability zones, B and C. And that is the reason why I'm adding it now, uh, this time here. B and C are the availability zones here. And then we deployed the front-end application somewhere here. This is our front-end web server running as part of a EC2 instance, this is that Node.js application that I have, uh, you know, shown up here. Last week, I showed you how to deploy the catalog service again in one of the public subnets itself. Ideally, this catalog service that we should have is as part of a private subnet. Why I created it in the public subnet was I didn't want to set up another NAT instance because the moment I move it to the private subnet, let's say this catalog service, let's call it as a backend application, right? So this is the front-end service, this is the backend service. This is our catalog service running here. Uh, I call it as a backend because we can combine multiple backend services into it and then multiple front-end services here. Let's say the catalog service, the moment we move this instance here, uh, now what is the problem here, right? So let's say I created a Ubuntu instance I have, uh, um, you know, um, it running in a private subnet. Uh, what could be the possible problem? Because this is a vanilla version of Ubuntu. We have to set up a catalog here. What would be the first problem that you would encounter here? Anyone? Uh, feel free to interact. Feel free I to- I go off? Yes. Yeah. I That's think it. the first, yeah. Uh... I think the first problem is uh, when a user 
wants to reach out to the backend, it, it cannot go through that through directly from then because it's on public IP and the backend is on private. And are you talking about the SSH connection or the, are you talking about uh, through web? Through, I mean, through web, I think. Perfect. First, yeah, the, no SSH. Definitely, just to, yeah. that is uh, definitely going to be an issue. Uh, what we are talking about is a user who wants to access the backend application, let's say catalog, cannot reach to this server at all because this is not in public subnet. This is not, um, does not have a public IP at all, right? But that's not going to be my first problem. Uh, what would be my first problem? This is definitely going to be a problem. Definitely, this is something we need to address. We will see how to do that. That's when we have one of the projects Project number three, uh, where we will set up a tunneling or project number four, where we have a reverse proxy. We'll solve that, but we don't have application here. Remember, my first problem is going to be, how do I connect to it? And how do I set up, uh, provide it with internet access? Because first you'll have to connect to the server, right? Secondly, you will have to have an internet access on this server uh, so that this can reach out to internet, go to the repositories, and download the packages and install those. We don't have that. That is the reason why I had put this in uh, the public subnet earlier, but now I want to move it to the backend. In fact, I have created Ubuntu server. I will show you what I have. This front end is running in uh, my public subnet public subnet to right here actually, right? So if I want to show you accurately where it is running, front end is running right here in the public subnet to. Uh, backend has been created and is running in the private subnet. You can see that uh, possibly from here. This is my private subnet and this is my uh, public subnet. This is how we have it. Front end is available right here because it has a public IP, it's in a public subnet, it has a public IP, it has access through the internet gateway. So this is available. So you can reach out to uh, this service and uh, that is working okay. Okay, now the first problem we'll have to tackle is, uh, we are not an external user, but we want to, we own this infrastructure, we have building this infrastructure. Let's say this is our workstation from the workstation, how do we connect to a server in the private subnet? Because just like external user, we don't have access to this directly either. So what is the solution? Garu, I, I have one question and one of the statement you have mentioned sometime back. Go ahead. Like, see, see you, you told like, uh, see, whatever the instances we have deployed will not have the access to the repository. Mm -hmm. Uh, but Correct. whenever we deploy an application on these EC2 instances, we use a Docker image, right? which which was which is a package of where we have packed all these things. Sure. Like uh, uh, whatever it is, OS or whatever the application. Sure. So you are saying that you want to deploy an application as a container image, uh, but that image has to be in the registry, right? Let's say Docker Hub. Correct. Isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So even to pull that image, you need an internet access uh, on this server right here. This particular server needs an internet access even for that. So it is irrespective of what we are using. If we have a package which we are downloading from a repository like Ubuntu repository with the APT package, or it could be a container image, unless you have it in the registry, which is private somewhere, in somewhere here, you have a registry or ECR if you're using. Uh, sure, that may save you from not going to internet, uh, but otherwise you need an internet access. Let's just take a traditional example because we are not even talking about containers here. Uh, we are focusing on cloud and Linux and networking stuff, like real core networking. So we'll say that we want to deploy a package, uh, APT package, and uh, uh, we want an internet access. Even with container registry here, we need an internet access, but let's forget about that. Let's say just a package manager, we need internet access. How do we solve it? Before we do that. Yeah, uh, hi Gaurav, this is Eman. 
So yes, sir. I want to suggest uh, we can use uh, netting uh, services where netting we can solve this problem uh, of providing the access internet. to the backend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Or we can use a proxy server. Perfect. Proxy server. When you say proxy server, what does that mean? You are talking about a proxy server here to which we will connect and we'll can go to go to internet, right? Right, right, correct. Ah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Let's say netting. So uh, a good solution, Hello. and this is perfect. So may I? Go ahead. So is it a peering connection? Peering uh, can work too. So um, let's say, but even with peering, what can happen is peering is when we talk about, you're talking about VPC peering, right? Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, with peering, what we can do is sure we can set up another VPC just like this and uh, have this VPC connect with this one. But again, still this needs to go out to the internet some way. That problem we're not completely solving, right? We can use a VPC, VPN uh, network also. Like if you have a corporate network and you are setting up a VPG virtual private gateway to your corporate uh, channel and via that if you are right routing, that may work also. That is one way, by the way, that is that may work. So why would you want to do that is then you can implement your network policies, firewall policy rules, everything from your uh, corporate network itself. That will work. Let's keep it simple. Let's just say we have a simple VPC. We just want to, first of all, connect to this and then set up an internet access to it. So as Heyman mentioned, I like the uh, concept of natting and that's how you typically provide the access to internet access to the private, uh, you know, let's say private servers. And how do you typically do it is you can launch a NAT gateway from the VPC. Okay, so what you do is you go to the VPC and from here you can go to the NAT gateways and you can create a NAT gateway, which is a high available managed service uh, and you can do that. Okay, so that's possible. And natting is the one we want to set up, right? Uh, uh, hi, Karo. Uh, sorry yes. to interrupt. Uh, just ahead. wanted to confirm uh, through the NAT, there uh, there would be one way communication or two way? One way. Okay, okay. Internet gateway is two way communication. That's why we have internet gateway, which is associated with the public subnets and the public subnet. It is two way. That is how the, this connection is actually going via internet gateway. So internet gateway is a two way con connection so that you can have an incoming connection from the external users. Natting is just for, let's say, connecting to internet. It's like how your home network is. Right now you're sitting at home, connected to Wi-Fi network. Uh, the external world cannot talk to your server unless it is specifically exposed to your local system. Uh, that is how it is. That's a NAT gateway. Okay. Got it. Now, Thank you. perfect. So the only twist here is going to be instead of setting up a dedicated NAT gateway, which is an additional entity and it will incur one is expense. Second is uh, we want to do more advanced stuff. So what we want to do is we already have the front end server here. Why don't we take this server? Because natting is just a, a configuration that you do on a Linux server. With NAT gateway, the advantage is, of course, you get high available uh, fault tolerant entity, and we don't have to worry about, oh, it going down and all that. So that advantage is there, but we want to do more advanced stuff and uh, we want to learn things through that. So how can we take an existing Ubuntu server and set up a NAT gateway is what we will learn. That's going to be our project number one. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, in fact, this will be our project number two. Why? Because we want to first provide access to the private server. We want to connect to the private server, SSH into the private server. Uh, how would we do that? That won't happen with NAT. How do we connect from, like, I have my workstation here sitting in my office in Bangalore. I want to connect to a server which is in Northern California in a private subnet of VPC sitting right here. This does not have a public IP 
this backend server does not have a public IP. It only has a VPC IP. Uh, I don't have a connection to VPC uh, directly, you know. So how can I access from this machine to this server? First, we have That's to go to the public uh, public instance, uh, log on to the public instance, and then uh, jump to the uh, private instance from there. Right. So we want to use this as a jump host, right? That's what you're suggesting. So you're saying that we have access to this. We can log into this, sure. And from here, you're saying that we will log into this one, right? Is that right? Correct. Okay. So then we will have to move our private key also here, isn't it? Yes, correct. Uh, so Bashan host also we can try. Uh, yeah, sure. like a jump server. Yeah, this is the same concept, right? Jump server concept is yeah, pretty yeah, much correct. same. So you can jump here and then from there you can connect to it. That is definitely option. We are going via this, yes, but we don't want to expose our private key here. Let's suppose there are 20 different uh, team members who are going to access this server also. And I don't want to expose my private key here at all. Is it possible? Uh, sorry, once again. I want to connect to this server. Why okay. this is fine, but I don't want to take my private key which I need to connect to this server from here. So if you say, I want to jump here, as in I will log in here first, from there I will log in here, I would need to take my private key and put it here. SSH key, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Can we avoid it? Is the question. See, SSH is very sophisticated. And SSH allows you to do a lot of different things. I'm going to show you at least a couple of interesting things here um, where you don't need VPN. You don't need uh, to or even copy over the key here and all that. And that can be achieved with this multi-hop connection uh, that I'm going to talk about. So that's going to be our first project where we set up this multi-hop connection. But we would directly log into this uh, without uh, sharing our private key. We'll use this as a kind of a proxy uh, command. So SSH has that option. And how do we do that is uh, it's very straightforward. It's not very complex, actually, just a configuration. If you understand this configuration, it's very easy. I've shown SSH config uh, during my uh, first day sessions sometime also. So this is a, a, what you see on the right hand side is SSH config. Why, what is this useful for is you can put all the configurations to connect to different servers. So if you're connecting to 20 different servers, just name them or create the connections and aliases with these names and define your IP address, keys, all the jazz right here. And you can just say, I want to connect to the server by saying uh, SSH FE gets me to the front end server. I don't have to worry about which key, what is the IP address. And I have this alias, so I can name it whatever I want. Uh, as well. So that's what you can do. Now, this is a connection to my front end server, the public server, not to the private server yet. Okay. But so this is the connection to the first server. Okay. To the jump server. Yeah. To this jump server right now. But what you can do is you ultimately want to connect to the back end server, right? So, not you don't want two hops. You just want kind of a one hop or direct connection. And that can be done with something called as uh, uh, SSH command that comes with um, a proxy command with SSH. And uh, okay. Yeah, this one. So it's going to look like this configuration. I already have it. I've added a description. To add a description, I've used AI, but uh, I have created a configuration by hand. So I will demonstrate uh, that to you. So it's very straightforward. I'll share this article. So this is like an article explaining everything. That explanation I've written with AI. But this is the configuration. So um, front end is what I am connected to on the left. When I say FE, uh, it connected to the host name using a user Ubuntu and this uh, um, key. And then I want to jump to the private connection. So. What I'm going to do is, if you look at this, this is where it gets interesting because I'm connecting to the private server. This is my internal server. 
So what I'll do is I'll take the IP address of my backend server. This is like 117 and I'll add it here. So let me edit my SSH config. I will share this with you. So you'll have access to this kind of a configuration. And this is my uh, private server. So what I'm doing here is actually this user can be different also, different than this. The key can be different also. Uh, let me do this one more time. And uh, look at this part. The proxy command is the one. What it is going to do is it's going to use or it's going to connect to this first. And via that, it's going to proxy my connection. So it will open up kind of a tunnel and then use this key. This key can be different than this one also. Okay, so the keys can be different. The usernames can be different. Everything can be different. Uh, no problems there. All you do is you establish a connection using a front end, this one, and then use that connection to jump over to the next hop. That is my private server, which is going to be uh, what happened to my config. Okay. So my private server is 117. Let me save this first and open it again. All right. So I'm just using this as a kind of a proxy to get to this one, this server. And the way it would work is just simply SSH private. And you will see I'm not sharing my private key anywhere. This server, which is my jump host, does not have my private key, nothing of that sort at all, right? Uh, no private keys, nothing, okay? And I'm connected to uh, my private server directly. That's what you can achieve with SSH proxy command. It's a very simple configuration. Yeah, and you can see that I'm on the, it doesn't even have if config. It doesn't have internet access, by the way. Nothing no internet access because it is in a private subnet, uh, no way for it to go out at all, right? But I'm connected to it via this multi-hop SSH proxy connection that I just showed you in this configuration. Uh, uh, sorry, so, this sorry to interrupt just one question. Account. So you connected this uh, private server from your from the local? Like from, from my your, machine. From your machine, okay. okay. <laughs> so what I did was, I connected to the private server from my machine right here and it went all the way till here uh, and you don't need a VPN. You don't even have to do a, two hops. You directly jump to the backend. Yeah. I have a question. Yes, Cedric, go ahead. So where uh, where do you keep all those private uh, private keys? Are they With in me. the private server in your SSH config? Where I see yeah. identify file? Uh, where are they exactly uh, kept? Those are my machines. Uh, this is my local machine. Let me go back here. This is my Mac uh, local machine, which has a SSH directory. This is where all my keys are, including this particular key, which is nothing but. Uh, you know the key file here, right here, uh, in this path. You know. Yeah, right. So that means that means if somebody has access to your mach to your machine, it can get your private keys. Is there yes. a way to to hide those? I mean, to, to no. You will have to protect your machine physically now. Uh, okay. You can you can change the permission so that and typically that's what is recommended and you will see that i have disabled the pump access to anyone on everyone except for me even the group that i belong to does not have access even not even read access to this key no one has a read access even read access to my key so it has to be either 400 or 600 meaning read only or read write only for the user and that's how you will have to protect it Okay. You can add a password to it. You can add a passkey on top of this. That is something you can do. So that's like additional measure that you can take here. That's what I was talking about. You mean the passphrase, right? Yeah, yeah. So on top of the key, while providing the key, it will ask you for a password, passkey. So is there any way we can uh, feed that passphrase without you typing it, without you prompting for it? 
<clears throat> I will check on that. Generally, you'll have to pass it. So can we add it to the SSH config? Or of course, you can write a Python script and uh, use expect to feed that in. So you can do that with a script. Uh, that's one way. But can SSH accept that kind of a passphrase also, SSH config? Um, I am not sure either. So we'll have to check. OK. Because uh, when this... like probably that is something we have to do like uh, we have to feed it uh, rather than like uh, doing interactively. Mm, yeah, so that is kind of equivalent than not having a passkey because if you feed it yeah. anyways, so it kind mm -hmm. of you defeat the purpose of the passkey also. So it's better to not have wherever you need complete automation, uh, you yeah. avoid using the passkeys then. Yeah. Got and this key yeah. is actually uh, the key that we that the private server is having the PEM file when it when it was created. Correct. Right? Yeah. That's the key. Okay. okay. We are talking about the public private key, and we are talking about the private key protecting that key, and public key can host on uh, go to the servers. Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is one interesting thing that you can do. Uh, and this is how you can get access to a server which is in a private subnet without requiring to have a VPN connection or um, anything else uh, apart from just a, you need one instance in a public subnet which, where you have need access. But uh, then you can drive everything from local configuration also. And that's how I'm onto that server um, inside. Uh, this is the server I'm on, uh, which is my private uh, server. No. Uh, <laughs> yes. uh, if this is just for the Ubuntu, but if you will talk about the RHL Linux, so the it's same type of configuration? Yeah, yeah. SSH is uh, universal, no okay. matter which, uh, uh, distribution which distribution you have. It okay. will work for Alpine, um, Mandrake, Zype, Suzy, any any Linux will work. No, no problem there. Okay, thank you. And sure. one question, um, like uh, the there is a use case that we have, like uh, we are having Ansible for configuration management. Sure. Um, and uh, we are having a couple of on-prem VMs. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and then we have, we have something called as Ansible uh, AWX. Sure. That is that is actually a open source version of Ansible Tower. Ansible Tower, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So we want to control, like uh, push some updates or uh, patch the on-prem VMs. Um, from AWS and that is installed in uh, AWS EKS. Mm -hmm. So the thing is actually when we went to the network team, they told like we cannot open the uh, connection between uh, EKS to on-prem because it will be a lot of SSH connections coming from um, AWS to the on-prem infrastructure. Rather they asked us to set up a proxy where the the requests are coming from one single server from AWS. Sure. So your use case is you have something in EKS, which is part of AWS, yeah. right? And you have an on-prem, which is uh, let's suppose your your office here. Yes. Right. So this is where your servers are, and there is something on EKS you have. Yeah. That is your AWS. AWS AWS is actually installed in EKS. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to set up? So we, I want to like actually push the updates or uh, like package updates and other things uh, to my on-prem infrastructure from, from here to here. Uh, from here, yeah. Mm, okay. But uh, if it's like a lot of, rec uh, I basically Ansible works on a SSH. Uh, SSH, yes. That's so right. it's like a lot of uh, SSH requests are going from here to the on-prem. But the network team is not accepting that. They want to, to set up a static proxy uh, mm. on AWS so that mm. the requests are coming from uh, one single IP uh, to the on-prem uh, servers. So even with AWS, you would have one single IP from where uh, it would send the request, right? Because your AWS would be running in one specific uh, uh, set of pods or something. Yeah. Cluster and a pod. So isn't is it not one single IP right now? This one. Uh, actually, when we requested the connection to be open, we gave three subnets, which is mm -hmm. used by the EKS, mm -hmm. uh, and then we gave the um, uh, ciders of the uh, on-prem infrastructure. 
Okay. Okay. Let me think about this and uh, see if I can, you know, come up with some other uh, possible solution. So right now, what they're saying is you so need. So what to have the a ask was proxy. from network team was set up a static proxy with private IP. Here. Here, yeah, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. route the request via that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, I need to understand this a little better. Why there are too too many IPs, and based on that, I could possibly. Uh, give you some suggestions, but yeah, that could uh, work. So you can set up a proxy and everything is being routed through that one single proxy yeah. that you have. And then it looks like, so so that it's easier to whitelist uh, at yeah. this level. Um, at uh, this level, it's easy to whitelist. Yeah, maybe I will just check on that uh, yeah. IP part once again and I will get back. Yeah, yeah. You can also Poppy, open Can up we a... do it through the IP tables? We can add into the IP tables and we can map it through over, over it. Well, that's what, so some IP table configuration that proxy will handle something like that. The other option I see is you set up some sort of a VPN connection, a side to side VPN connection between AWS and your network and route these requests via this VPN connection so that there is no need for you know, whitelisting any public IPs and all that. This can be possibly approached using multiple ways, um, which we can debate. But uh, um, yeah, IP table, then see, requests are, if they're coming from multiple IPs, I don't know why they're coming from multiple IPs. That's what we'll have to figure out. And then if you want to do something with IP table, like maybe natting, not natting, but two-way, uh, we'll have to set up something here. Uh, or maybe a connection like this here so that it travels over a private or an encrypted channel. Yeah, but I think we'll or take you this are up. actually suggesting like uh, setting up a direct connect. Um, hmm. Direct maybe... connect can work also. Yeah. And that that, that, so this direct connect and side to side are different or side to side and direct connect are same? Can be done with direct connect. Um, it is similar. Can be okay. done with direct connect, can be done with uh, some sort of a, a VPG, VPN gateway, can okay. be done with even your open VPN connection. So there can be multiple options, solutions there. Direct connect, I think, goes via your ISP or something, but uh, there are various ways of doing it, actually. All right. Th thanks, Karo. Thanks for your show. Okay. All right. So we'll move on from here. So we want to look at this and uh, move on faster because we have a few more projects to do. So one thing that I showed you is how to connect to this server. Now that I'm connected to this server, the second project now is how do we provide it with the internet access? So we talked about NAT gateway, uh, but we don't want to set up a separate NAT gateway. We want to use the existing server and route request through that itself. I'll draw this again to simplify it. So we have the VPC with four subnets the public, two public subnets here, uh, two private subnets here. The backend serv uh, server is here. The frontend server is here. And uh, we want to set up the frontend server itself as the NAT instance. Is it possible? Uh, got one minute. I had one question on similar lines on the previous uh, discussion. Sure. Okay. Um, so it's just, uh, I wanted to close it uh, early. So I do not want any instances on the player, on the public subnet. In that case, I can have a load balancer and then uh, the request comes to my load balancer and it gets forwarded to my uh, NAT gateway and then comes to the instance. That setup is no, also- that, that won't work. You need as such access to route this request or you can have a VPN gateway. You can set mm -hmm. up a VPN gateway uh, and then connect to that so that you have an encrypted channel in and that will work, but not just a load balancer. Just load balancer uh, would not work uh, at all because <clears throat> NAT gateways don't allow that incoming connection in this direction actually. So that won't work. So no, what uh, I'm saying is I have a load balancer in my public subnet. Sure, I have sure. a proxy in my private subnet. So the request is coming from the load balancer to the hmm. proxy and the proxy redirected to this backend server, backend whatever. Hmm. That's right. 
So then you can directly redirect here also. So if you're talking about web request, you can do that. But that doesn't still give this server access to the internet, the one we want. So what we want to achieve is this is a private server. I should be able to go out to internet like the typical thing that we do is ping google.com. This will still not work with the setup that you're suggesting. You can possibly provide access. If this is a web server, you can route the HTTP request via this and land up here. Uh, that you can possibly do, but not uh, uh, the other way around, right? So we are talking about how do we provide internet access here so that this can go out to the repository and fetch something and update itself or install something here. That is what we are trying to solve now. That is where NAT comes in. Okay, got it. Sorry. Got yeah. It. Yeah. So can we set this up as a NAT? The answer is, of course, yes. With Linux, you can do anything and everything. And you can go out to the internet through this server itself. And we can make that as a NAT gateway. We can, in fact, add it to the route table also. And already we have this route table where we have uh, 10, 0, 0, 0 for private. Uh, local is there. But we can add one more route and make this particular server as a uh, gateway as well. Okay. So in the route table for the private subnet, I think this is the one I have here for private subnet. Uh, uh, I will just confirm that for this instance, there is this private subnet and this private subnet has uh, this particular route table associated with it. Yeah, and this is the current route. We can add another route uh, to it as well. So what do we need to do here? First thing that I'm connected to, or I will connect to uh, front end here. By the way, where is this configuration? There was this uh, question. Where is this configuration? The configuration related to SSH and the keys, everything is on my local machine. This SSH config is my local config. Just read up on SSH config you'll get a pretty good, decent idea about it. We also have it as part of our uh, system engineering bootcamp. Now, I'm logging into the front end server. Okay, I will become a root here. Now this server, the left hand server is what I'm going to connect. So I'll keep this ping connection open till this succeeds. Okay, uh, that's when we'll know that this server has an internet gate, uh, internet access and we will use this as a NAT gateway. So I'll set set this up as a NAT server. For that, I'll have to do some configurations. What are those configurations? First of all, I'll have to set up something called as an IP forwarding. So this needs to be needs to have a capability of taking the IPs uh, and the packets coming in and send it to the outside world, like internet. You also need some rules, IP table rules to do that. But you also need to have the I forwarding enabled first. A lot of this is a very common configuration for a lot of other things. If you want to set up your server as a router in a lot of places, like when you want to set up Kubernetes, where you are doing some software defined networking, again, you will typically have to enable the IP forwarding here at the kernel level. All of this is handled by the Linux kernel. So how do we go, do, go about doing that? So to set this up as a NAT gateway, I will have to first set up the IP forwarding. So this will work as a uh, gateway. The connections will come from the private server and it will go out to the internet. And for that, the IP forwarding uh, is this configuration. So if I show you this, this is typically set to off. IP forwarding is not enabled, it's set to off, zero. You have to set it to one. So you can use syscuttle to set it to one and it is set to one now. It has started forwarding it, but if I want these changes to be permanent, this is just a one-time thing. If I restart the system, it will not be permanent. If I want to make it permanent, I'll have to edit this file where I have the syscuttle configuration which are read by the kernel. These are some network configurations for the kernel. And this is where I'll have to add uh, somewhere here, uh, somewhere anywhere in this file, I'll have to add the uh, IP forwarding configuration. Yeah, and then I can reload the syscuttles using syscuttle minus p, and it has taken that change. 
and made it permanent. Secondly, <laughs> it has enabled the forwarding. Now I have to set up, I am talking about this server, okay, this particular server. And on that server, we want to enable the IP forwarding. So this is the Ubuntu server, right? Uh, we set up the IP forwarding so that it can take the packets and forward it to the outside world. Now we also need to set up a rule which is used by IP tables. IP tables has many chains. One of that chain is related to NATing. It's part of something called as a post routing uh, when it does the NATing. So you have to add uh, a rule and you can look at the NATing rules uh, using this command also. Currently there are none. So you have to enable this uh, particular rule. Why ENX zero? Because this is the this is the interface that I have. Let me install the net tools. I like I if config, even though there is IP at ADDR show, I prefer if config, my old school guy. So ENX zero, this is the interface we have. So through this interface, whatever it is receiving, we want it to be sent out. You know, and it uses that masquerading so that it can also return back. When it returns, it will also know where to send it and all that. So we have to add a couple of rules here. One is this masquerading. Second is this forwarding rule. So I add this rule first to the NAT table. And uh, you can see this rule being added, right? For this ENX0 from anywhere. So you can also restrict it to certain uh, networks also and then you have to use the IP tables forwarding rule and it's going to forward from here to here because in AWS there is just one interface there are no two interfaces for public and private if there had been a lot of routers have two physical interfaces and it takes the request from one network forwards it to the other um, that's how you do routing or even natting based on what you want to do so since it's just one interface our input interface output interface are same and we want to establish. So whatever comes in, so we, if we want to send it back to that server also, we want to provide uh, this particular rule also, right? And then uh, the explanation of this is there. I've just added it for you to understand uh, what I'm trying to do here and which one is needed, which one is not. And then we can save this, make them permanent. I will do that later, but there is one configuration you'll have to make because with these rules, actually, we should start seeing something change here. Uh, there is one more configuration though that AWS has, which blocks the uh, these kind of packets because it uses something called a source and destination checks. So there are actually two things I need to do. One is I'll have to make sure that in the route table of the private subnets, uh, we have a route which says everything else like 0.0.0.0 zero should point or go through uh, this particular instance or the network uh, interface that is associated with it. And so that's how it, it will translate to that. So I'll have to edit the rule and I can add a rule here uh, in this route table. I can go to the route table. This is the route table. And to this route table, I can add a rule which says everything else goes via not internet gateway, but a NAT, not even NAT gateway because we are not using the AWS managed NAT gateway. We are saying route it via an instance. And this is where I pick my front end because this front end instance will act like a NAT server. So it picks up the ENI. ENI is the network interface which is associated with that particular instance. If you look at ENI ending 5AC, ENI is the network in interface associated uh, with that particular instance. So you can see 5AC is associated with that particular server, which is front uh, security group is this, and uh, this is the VPC ID. You can see the IP address and all of that. And that is what is associated with this instance, which is my front end, right? So basically what we are saying is for the, if you want to go outside, go via this particular instance. That is what this is referring, this rule, right? Again, we still don't have this working yet. 
because AWS has this source and destination check. So this server has that check. So it is blocking anything coming from outside. This is like a security major, right? And uh, we'll have to disable that for now. It's part of our VPC itself. And in the actions, security, uh, our networking, change source and destination check, we'll have to stop this. The moment you stop it, and if you have the rules, relevant rules, you see the internet access working here. So we just set this up as a NAT server. It's just a couple of IP table rules. You just need to accept the, uh, understand these, uh, uh, these rules. And this is for reverse connection, actually. So you send the connections with Masquerade, and when it returns back from outside, it is destined for not this server, but for the, in, uh, the other server, the internal server. So it is going to send it back to that server. And that is this rule. And uh, these are the two rules you need. In fact, you don't need that third rule. This is not even needed. This one. Yeah, this is not even needed. You just need this rule and that uh, natting masquerade rule. And uh, that's going to be enough. And this helps you set up your existing instance, make it work. Again, it will work on Red Hat, on Ubuntu, anything, because IP table is the same. Right, so you can set up these kind of rules on any server as well, uh, and it will work there. So now the second project is we set this up uh, as uh, the NAT server, and now we have an internet access here. Now that I have an internet access here, I can go and install the catalog service here. This is where I want to install the second service, which is catalog. So I have uh, set up the front end, which you can see here. The second thing is I want to set up a catalog. Yeah, which shows up the products here. I have shown the catalog service, how to install it last time with the database also. So I'll just quickly go and set up the catalog service itself. I've scripted it already. How do you write a script is very simple. You just take the, if you look at this, this is a script, right? It took me five minutes and uh, not much of a brains because uh, all I did was uh, took the catalog service instructions that I used last time and convert it into a script by just adding these lines uh, one at a time. The only place where I had to use my brain was adding this and then this part where to generate a file, you have to do some catting like this. So because you can create a file and add these content to that file. So you say cat your until EOF, keep on reading. That's what it says. What this says is until you see this EOF, this EOF can be XYZ also. So you just have to use XYZ here. This is a standard thing. You use your AOF until this, I have a content and take that content and put it in this file. That's what we are saying with this, this thing. Everything else is just a set of instructions. Like I install this, I go into this directory. Uh, and I then, you know, with this concept. <clears throat> it was difficult for me to play this role. Right. And then I generate the file, reload the daemon and uh, there I go. Right, so I can take this script and execute it. I just have to replace this with my code and uh, I'll try to run this and then I'll show you how to connect it to the database as well. The database backend, there was a script problem that I showed you last week. I have fixed it already, so it will work if you just use that. Now that I have this code, um, internet access here, I can use these commands actually. Earlier, it was not possible. So even though it is a private entity, private server, now it does have an internet access. It can pull this code. It has done that. It can go to the repositories. If you have containers, it can go to the registry and fetch the catalog from, uh, I mean, the packages from there or images from there. Uh, whatever you want to do, you can do now. Now, uh, where is my code? Let me go to the repository. So let's say this is the code. This is where the repository is and uh, something like this, or I can create a fork of it and use that as well. If I have my own fork of it, I can use that as well, right? And then this is where uh, my code is. So I will take this and use it here. So when I clone it, uh, I have not tested it, so I may have to make some changes. So it is installing Python. 
configuring Python, then it does some virtual environment activation, then it uh, replaces the uh, or changes the permission to non root user. I want to use the best practice where the application should be run as a non root user. That is always a good idea. And then it will create a configuration where it will add a systemd uh, file as well. Let me try and uh, execute this. Hopefully this would go through maybe with one or two changes. And this should set up, set up the catalog application for me. See, so writing script is what you have to do as an ops and DevOps person, but it is not really a big deal because you just take your instructions and convert it into a script like uh, I have here. Yeah, you just have to uh, take care of a few things like use minus y something here. And if you want to make it more sophisticated, you can have uh, some checks here. That's where your conditionals will come in. So you can use the if else conditional saying checking oh, whether this path has been cloned or not. Only then you CD. Uh, you may want to do further checks like whether this user is present or not. Only change the permission. So that's when you may have to use conditionals and some additional logic as well. Uh, but that's it. So you have... Uh, and we are installing Python here because that is a Python based application. application. Right. Yeah. So okay. this catalog service is a Python application. You can see it's a Python Flask application. And this is uh, uh, how you install it, pip install something and then runs on 5,000 port, this is how you launch it. And that's why my script has the same logic where uh, this is how it installs it. This is how it launches it, Unicorn, Python, and binds it to that 5,000 port. It just that we want to run it as a daemon or a service rather than running it by hand. So we create a systemd configuration for that service and it comes up after the networking configs. So till here, so this comes after the network target. So systemd has these targets. So as soon as the networking comes up, it starts launching this as one of the services. It runs in parallel. So that's what we have defined here. So that's the script. And uh, uh, it, this is fantastic. So in the first run itself, it has started. So you see it has installed it it added that systemd configuration for catalog. It has already started it. So if I check it locally, curl localhost colon 5000 should be my catalog service. It is there, it is running. If I see this content, uh, it's working fine. At least the initial version definitely is working fine. Now, the next question is, the next product for us is, now that the application has been deployed here, this received an internet access, we deployed the application, everything is working great. Now, how do we access it? We want to access it from, let's say, initially, we'll say from our workstation, we want to access it here. And then later, expose it to the external user as well. How do we do that? Is the question now. Right, it still remains in a private network. This has an internet access, which is a one way thing, but you can't reach out to it directly yet. Right, so let's say this is my database or this is my application. I want to connect to it, uh, it's running in the back end. How do I do that? Is typically can we have a load balancer and the user will let the load balancer, the load balancer will forward it to the private server? You can do that. Uh, yes, but uh, we will look at load balancer later. You can approach it different ways. You can possibly have a load balancer here and then route the request to that as well. But let's say a lot of time, see, this is the kind of scenario you have where you have set up a web server. Now your company is not going to allow you to set up a load balancer yet, but you still want to do the development and testing and want to connect to this server. Uh, without load balancer, how would you do that? Or it could be a database running here or maybe there's a database uh, subnet somewhere and you want to connect to the database using a mysql workbench 
or a PostgreSQL, a graphical application here. Uh, API call, no. Um, we don't want to make API calls. Uh, even with API calls, you need to have an access to the API uh, server service here, right? So <laughs> we'll go back to the same SSH through VPN, yes. You can set up a VPN, but again, I'm going to be more frugal and more, I want to use more complex system so that you understand these technologies, how things work, not complex. It's not that complex, but without additional cost or setup, uh, we want to learn how to do these things, kind, you know, uh, and these are very useful things in day-to-day -day life, right? So you can actually do this using the same SSH thing. With SSH, you can set up v even VPN, by the way. But we are not even doing that. It's a very simple setup. Now, this is something you should all know. Uh, this is a very, very useful thing. This is called as SSH tunneling. That's going to be our project number three. So how do we set up the SSH tunneling? Right? So this SSH tunnel allows you to forward one port from your system. Let's say I'm going to take, this is running on 5,000 port. I'll create a tunnel in a way that if I go to localhost 5555, it takes me to this. Again, it's a search tunnel. So it takes me via, via this here. But I will be able to load the application and it's an encrypted com communication, secure connection. So I would be able to load my application on localhost colon 5555. Okay, so how do we do that? Very simple, just one command, okay? Just one simple command will help you do that. You just need to know how to connect to your, uh, this jump server, right? Just take that command. Uh, I will show you here. I'll take that command first. I'll check the configuration also. So uh, let's say if I want to connect to that server from my Mac, I would use SSH minus I. I can possibly use SSH uh, FE also, but let me show you a raw thing. So I will use this key and uh, connect to the server with uh, something like this. This is typically how we connect. This is my public server, okay? Now this is SSH connection. I'm logging out again. I just wanted to do a quick check here. So how do we set up a SSH tunnel? Is um, It's been really long, I've used it, but uh, it is very useful. Nevertheless, so this is what I used to do a lot uh, to connect to the servers and in, inside some network, uh, which is not available publicly. And this is the command that you use, right? Just remember, note down this command somewhere. It's very useful. So what are we doing here is from my server, 5555, sh minus L will help you create that tunnel, right? And then minus N is no execute on, it's not executing anything, any command on this server, uh, just forwarding the connection. So there are some options there. So this is where I would set up a tunnel from my machine to the final destination, the private server. This is gonna be the private server's IP. This is gonna be the private server's IP. So I'll pick it from here to make it very, very clear and explicit. So this is the private server backend server. This is the private IP. This doesn't have a public IP. We know that. And then I'm using my, this is where I provide my connection to the server. It's very simple. Now it's just about minus I followed by this. That's why I checked it so that I can, I know that this is going to work. And what this is going to do is it's going to open up a port a tunnel from my 5555 to this server's 5000 via this particular uh, host. 5000 is this destination. And then I just use this as my intermediary host to set up, to help me set up that tunnel. That's it, tunnel is done. So if I go here, refresh, <clears throat> I have my catalog 
right? On my local host, right? From my local host, this is an encrypted channel and I can access the products, the APIs, everything from that server. No VPN connection, nothing else. A simple SSH will give you all these capabilities. That's why SSH is something you should know. It's not just about the remote connection. It's much more than that. You can use it for multi hops. You can use it to set up these tunnels. You can have multi-level tunnels. Uh, it gets really interesting from there. You should all try this. Uh, at least this much you should know about, right? It, it, it can do many other things, but at least this much you should know. So this is the tunneling uh, that we use. And this can be useful for, let's say I have a, a database front-end UI application, like there is a MySQL workbench, which is a, a graphical application sitting on your desktop. And you want to connect to the da database backend. You can't directly connect to it because it's in a private network. So you can set up a tunnel, which goes via this and lands upon a particular port on the database and you can access it local from local machine, very much possible, right? It just take this, you can actually automate this tunneling also so that oh, every time my system comes up or every time this happens, I just want this uh, tunnel to be set up. You can do that, right? So uh, in fact, we had this very sophisticated tunneling mechanism to connect to our database. And we had this as part of our automation script uh, in my uh, previous organization, we used to do that. So just set this up and we just run one command and it sets up like opens up uh, 32 tunnels to like 30 plus databases. And, uh, you know, we had this so pretty interesting connections set up there in a secure way. So you can do a lot of interesting stuff uh, with SSH actually. So that's, uh, that's something, I hope this is something you find interesting. Yes, no? Yes, uh, one one question like this, the it is now accessible from local host, right? Correct. Uh, and uh, it will be accessible, like if I hit that URL, it will be accessible yeah. for me as well? No, this is a very private line, line from my host to uh, this server. And that is how it is meant to be with the SSH tunneling. So okay. that is what it is, right? Now we're going to come to that, the question that you asked, like, oh, this is good, but it is for a private line. What about the external user? Can they access it? No, they're not supposed to, but they can via a reverse proxy. That's why we want to bring in Nginx. Again, I'm going to be very frugal and use the same server. We, we've used it as a front end. We've used it as a NAT. I'm also going to use it as a, and it's, a, it's just a T2 micro. Uh, we're going to use it as a Nginx. Nginx is very lightweight. Okay. So it will fit in no problems. So we'll set up this as Nginx reverse proxy and the reverse proxy will basically uh, be kind of an application sitting on top of your services could be public private. And then this is the one where the request comes in. And from here, it will establish a new connection, get the response back and show it to the customers. That is the reverse proxy thing here right uh, you can also call it as a edge router i've added some description about what is a reverse proxy what is the purpose of it it can let you do load balancing it does the request routing like what i just showed you load balancing of course because it if you have multiple instances it can also do the uh, balancing across that but it's more like a router that we're using it for and uh, it can also uh, hide the backend from the customers, right? So it acts like a level of security there. It can do caching, it can do rate limiting, it can act like a API gateway. Uh, you can do many other things with this and Nginx fits in a very well uh, for this reverse proxy thing. Very popular solution for that. That's why we've taken Nginx. Now I'm going to go to my front end server and set that up as a, on right, I'll still connect to my private server. All of that is still working. And here I'm going to set up Nginx. Very straightforward. So right now my application is accessible. This is the backend. Forget about this, right? We'll not use it now. Uh, let's look at the front end. I can use it with port number 3000. That's where it is running on this server. On this front end server, it's running on port number 3000. Let's just focus on this part where we have this front-end server 
it's running on port 3000. It's also acting as a NAT gateway, right? So it is doing that port forwarding back, forward and back. And then we also want to set this up as a Nginx edge router. This will run on port 80. And then it will route to this service or it can route to a private server, which is an application uh, catalog running on port 5000. So we can make it route to this as well based on some headers, based on some routes saying that, oh, if you hit the 80 port with no URL, send it to front end. If you hit it with uh, uh, slash catalog, send it to, you know, the catalog service. So you can define those kind of routes. Uh, that's why the edge router or a reverse proxy. And that's what I want to set up here, Nginx. So on the left-hand side, that's my front-end server. That's where I would set up uh, Nginx and configure it as a reverse proxy. So installing Nginx, very straightforward. Just run an apt-get install of Nginx. Let it complete. Uh, we'll check. I know, like, why it is called as a reverse proxy and not as a proxy. Uh, hey, the forward proxy is typically there are forward proxies and reverse proxies. So forward okay. proxies typically you have uh, if you are going in this direction, it's probably forward proxy. If it is coming out of here from the, this is the reverse connection, so that's why the reverse okay. proxy. Okay. Right. Okay. So it's simple as that. Uh, think of it as a router though. So it's like an edge router. Uh, that's a more appropriate thing for it. Now this runs on port 80. Let me check for front end if that port is open or not. I think I have opened it as part of my testing. I'll just confirm the inbound rules. Yeah, port 80 is open. So my Nginx should show up immediately. Uh, it's already running. System CTL. So the, the request will be actually going to Nginx. From Nginx, it will go to the private uh, web app, and then it will come from the, the response will come from web app to Nginx to the customer. Correct. Correct. That's how it will work. So right now, uh, Nginx is there, but it's not been configured as a reverse proxy yet, right? How will it work when it comes to reverse proxy? So with reverse proxy, the as you said, that's what is going to happen. Let's say this is Nginx. And behind that, I have uh, two applications, app one, app two. So when you establish a connection as a user from your browser, it ends here, kind of, it terminates here. A new connection opens to the backend. And that's why you have to also rewrite certain things here. I will talk about that. And then a response comes back, which is then sent to the user. So the user's communication is with the Nginx and Nginx is communicating with these backing services uh, and then sending response back to the user. That is how uh, it does it. It's not like a pass through, it's more like a processing of that request. And that is why when you set up Nginx, you have to do certain configurations and the configurations reside in HC Nginx here. The main config file is nginx.conf which typically loads whatever you enable from the site's enabled directory in this one and this one. So mainly your files configuration exists in sites enabled. So what goes in sites enabled is basically this is a link. There are two directories here. I will show you. So sites enabled is linking from sites available. So why this is created this way is because you can have multiple sites configured or added as a configuration out of 10 at any given point in time. Maybe let's say you just want to enable two. So this is the setup you can create, create a sim link. This is a symbolic link. You should know about symbolic link, hard links. The difference is also, by the way, this is a symbolic link. So this is a symbolic link, which is pointing to sites uh, available. So the actual configuration resides here. And then whatever you want to enable, you just link it to here. That's uh, what you do. So we basically go to sites enabled or sites available rather and start adding our configuration here. And then you can enable it later. This default configuration is what shows 
this page, this default page, and you know it's processing that, and it has some, uh, you know, it's coming out of this probably uh, part, and it's listening to port eighty, and that configuration is here. We'll disable this. We'll have our own configuration for a reverse proxy. What configuration would it be? It would look like this. So sites enable default. We will remove not the actual config. Okay, and this is also why. This is useful because when I remove it, it's just enabled sites, not the actual configuration. The sites available still remains there. The default configuration is still there. It has just been removed from enabled sites. Yeah, I just deactivated it kind of. So without deleting the configuration, that's a good part. That's why this two directory configuration is very useful. Now we want to add our own config uh, to craftista.conf. If you look at the path, it's in the same directory. That's why I've just taken the last bit. I'll add it and explain to you. This is where we add the reverse proxy configuration. Now, what do we add as a reverse proxy? First of all, it's going to listen on port 80. Yeah, that's what we want. Location is this, meaning if anyone sends a request without any particular path, just a root request like XYZ or just the IP address, it's going to handle or go via this particular route. What is that route? It says this is going to send a proxy pass. This is the reverse proxy configuration. If you have multiple servers, like multiple front ends, there will be multiple such lines, proxy pass. You can also decide an algorithm then to load balance. So you can add that configuration. And then we add a bunch of headers. The reason why we add this is because all the headers are lost at the Nginx because of this two hop connection. So when you send a request, you're, you're sending headers like what is my IP and uh, a bunch of other things. What is the path I'm looking for? Who am I and all that? So those headers are lost here. And that's why you have to take those headers, whatever headers were sent, and you rewrite it and send it on this request with this configuration. And you can be selective. What is the real IP? Otherwise, the source will look like Nginx only. What is the actual customer IP? You can pass it on using this header and the protocol and the host and the port uh, from the source. This is what we are talking about, right? And that's what you can add as headers uh, to this connection. And then you say, pass it to this one. To what? Because we are running this on the same host, the front end application on the same host port 3000. So that is our proxy pass. Or this is what we are passing to. The request by default is being passed with this route to here. Simple as that. That's what we are adding. And we'll enable it also because this is just a configuration we are adding. We have to also enable it by creating a sim link. So symbolic link you use ln minus s. And this is the source sites available to sites enabled. And now sites enabled has this configuration only. And you can check before applying by running nginx minus t. This is a syntax check. If and only if everything is okay, would you want to re reload, not even restart. You can just reload the configuration without restarting nginx, just system CTL reload. That's it. And now, if I go back to that default path, this is not 5000 or 3000 port, just a default path. This Nginx is sending it to my, acting like a reverse proxy, sending this request to my service and showing the response back here. And that's how Nginx works, right? So that's the reverse proxy. This is just one service. You can add many. And this is where you can provide access to your service through this reverse proxy to your external customers as well. And uh, this is what we're gonna establish now from the user through this reverse proxy. Now Nginx, through that, we want to land upon this port with a particular path. What path? Let's pick this path called as catalog. And that should say, check, take you to this service. Now, if you say slash catalog here, Same host and port, okay? Just a different path. Quick question. Yeah. So what's the benefit of uh, um, 
configuring reverse proxy on the same front end server what if the front end server goes down and yeah so don't you see? see right now this is not a high available neither high available fault tolerance setup this is a single point of failure this is not an ideal configuration but what we are looking at is just how uh, reverse proxy in general works why are we configuring on the same server is just for the cost reasons we don't want to spend uh, if you are doing this as a lab um, not a production environment you want to think about how many servers you want to launch right ideally this would have been ideal so ideally we could have created uh, uh, one NAT instance maybe multiple front-end servers right and then on top of that <clears throat> even this one is a single point of failure so maybe multiple such instances or some mechanism to fail over to a different nginx and uh, that's what we would do or rather in case of aws in fact we can use a, a alb which is well integrated with aws does similar things also and we could have used alb and target group so if given a choice i would use that but since we want to learn about nginx and how it works in general, uh, I wanted to take this as a intermediary project where we talk about reverse proxy, talk about Nginx configuration, because this is something a lot of operations folks have to uh, configure actually Nginx and know how to how this works and how it gets configured. So that's why we are taking it purely for that reason. It is not a high available setup. It's, not, it's, just, it's very much a single point of failure right now. Yeah, hi. one question for me. Yeah. Actually, so multiple front end and multiple back end also we can uh, configure yes. in Nginx. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. So this way we will do that. I think next uh, next uh, mission will do that. So next mission will be like we want to scale this. So the back end services you can have multiple instances. In case of AWS, you will create something called as target groups, and the load balancer will send it to the target group and add the load balancer itself. You can add similar rules saying that if the request is XYZ or if the request is slash catalog, send it here. If the request is everything else, send it here and so on. So you can do it for any services or all services that high availability. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, one question actually this front end and we are front end and back end, right? Um, so typically like the request will come to the front end and then if a user is clicking on some button or something in the application, uh, it will be, it will go to the back end and back end will respond with something and that will in turn come to the front end and then go to the uh, user. Correct. But it will not uh, directly go to the back end, right? In general. No, uh, I think we talked about this architecture. Like there is a server side rendering in which case front end will risk and this application is done that way. So we don't even really need to have expose everything to the back end all also. So our front end and there is a catalog service, there's a cart service, there is a recommendation engine or review service and front end is loading this and responding back also. Right now that is how it is. So this yeah. doesn't need per se all this configuration, not necessarily, but there are use cases where your clients from your browser is loading one component from service X, second component from service Y, third component from service Z. And uh, all of these are like uh, independent microservices. You can call them as front end, back end, or maybe different services. And uh, uh, different parts from your browser are connecting to different backends also. Sometimes that is okay. the case. Yeah, like, so, like a catalog service or a cart service, a payment yeah, service. So it will be like slash catalog or slash cards of the same application is going to this and this service. Got it. Got it. And it will be redirecting to different target groups based on the path that we are. Looking. Correct. Correct. It is possible. So we are considering all possibilities. It's not that this application does it in this way or that way. This application is been designed to be exposed with just front end also and then backend loads from the front end, as you said, but uh, a lot of times uh, in the browser now browser has become like a application loader, right? 
and with that you can have it in a way that you are making call different api calls to different services right from the browser itself and it is loading some components of it uh, from different services so in the in that case you definitely need this kind of reverse proxying thing Gauru. yes yeah i have a question here see uh, mm -hmm. in the scenario where we have this load balance uh, uh multiple front end of it, uh, this this page not mm -hmm. this this the other page uh are we talking about anything like here yeah yeah some this one see mm -hmm. here we have this uh, load balancer and multiple front ends and multiple back ends right so okay. whatever the configurations we have spoken all this time like uh, on the which we have uh, configured so far on the front end application so all these things will be done now on this uh, load balancer right suppose if the request has to go to the back end through the load balancer so what are the configurations we have spoken so far should be done on this alb can be done on alb namely proxy passing so if you are talking about nginx configuration that i shown you yes so these configuration uh, will typically be done for this kind of routing where oh this rule sends it to this particular service those kind of configurations will go to load balancer instead yes that is correct so will it be like uh, for each uh, means now we have multiple each microservice yeah each microservice so right. will uh, in the configuration file in the nginx configuration file we will uh, create a root or the root, uh, whatever the rule we have defined will it be mm -hmm. for each instance or uh, for the entire uh, cluster each instance right now right now each instance it's not okay. a service discovery or anything this is a very crude way of doing it uh, with nginx i have to agree on that uh, with load balancer, it would be better because with load balancer, what we would do is we would send it to a particular target group. Yeah. Load balancer makes it easy, uh, application load balancer, because with load balancer, what we will do is let's say if we have a cat front end catalog voting recommendation, let's say we are talking about front end and catalog, we're going to have a different target group for each and load balancer will say to this target group, not like individual instances. So the problem with this Configuration is every time an instance changes, you have to come and update it here. Right. <laughs> right? That's a lot of uh, configuration, right? Versus with load balancer, that's why I would use a load balancer in this case for sure, because with that, it solves my problem of discovering the services. It'll all be target part of target group. If the new instances get launched, it is handled by the target group. If they get deleted, it is removed by the target group. So target group is going to maintain the instances, their endpoints and everything. And then from load balancer, I'll just say, oh, if this is the path, send it to here, this target group. If this is the path, send it to that target group. So that makes it easier. Thanks. Yeah. So this configuration explicitly, I have taken this use case to explain to you how Nginx reverse proxying works. And when it comes to the world of Nginx, we'll have to rely on external service discovery like console. You can still achieve that, but you'll have to have additional things like console for service discovery or something else, some DNS service or some other configuration here, right? So I just showed you one service. So there is more, right? So it is gonna get more complex and have more such entries. So for slash, I want to send it to, let's say front end for slash catalog, I would add it add another route like this i'll also add some error handling so error handling can be added as well like this so so let's say if this is kind of our initial dev kind of a setup and then we make it more sophisticated with load balancers and stuff that's what we would also take up later but uh Error handling, you can say if there is an error, it will send it to bad request, right? So if there is a problem, if I'm uh, trying to access a path which doesn't exist, it gives me 404 error, right? Right now it's 404. And then here, if uh, this service is not present, see, the observe the error not found on this server right now. And uh, if I go here right now, it loads the application. If the application is supposed down, 
what will it do is stop front end then it's gonna give me uh, i think a 502 error here bad gateway so these kind of errors we can trap and handle and provide certain custom messages as well uh, that's what is happening here so instead of this bad gateway we will say server is currently unavailable in instead of uh, uh, the other uh, message where we had server not found so this see this kind of thing can be used by attackers to find out what parts are available and traverse it right so this is there this is not there so if you want to mask it we can say bad request so you can handle the errors it's good to do that and we have to basically restart the engine service for it to pick the new configuration, right? No, reload, reload. is fine. Reload. Yes. Oh, yeah. reload. I'm doing the syntax check and now I'm reloading it. I just wanted to show you the errors first. So this is not found. Now it is going to be handled as unavailable uh, here, right? And uh, if this is the service, uh, this is where it is says unavailable and then it will be bad request if there is something else. Should be something like a bad request or something which uh, it should be handled in in that way right so still is saying 503 server currently unavailable let me start the front end service <coughs> yeah bad request it's gonna keep on saying now and uh, this is now loading and everything else will be uh, like sent to a bad request basically and if the service is not available it will handle using the error codes that uh, we have now if i want to add one more route like catalog which is not available right now yeah and then catalog has uh, the other um, api connections also right now it says bad request because catalog has not been handled We'll have to add it. So just like that, instead of uh, slash, we say catalog, and then we pass it to the backend service where catalog is running. So for catalog, it's going to look like this. So earlier we had front end. Front end was just slash, which sends it to this service uh, on the same server right now. Catalog is going to send it to um, a proxy pass to the private server. The private server has an IP address of uh, this. Yeah, this is for the catalog service. And, uh, and for front end, we are not giving the front end servers IP, rather, we are giving the local host. Because it's running on the same server. If oh, it had okay. been a different uh, uh, address, it would have been given. So it shows up this. The CSS I still have to figure out. But uh, the products are not shown because if I say all products, it takes a specific path like slash API products. Now it is trying to handle it at the level of Nginx, that API products. The catalog service can handle it because it has that slash API products on that server, but not here. So if I, I think if I change it to... this uh this is able to handle it right because uh, this is directly sending it to the catalog service and all that so catalog can handle it nginx doesn't know how to do that because it is being interpreted by nginx at this level so at the level of nginx again we'll have to add a route for api something so api product send it to the catalog service so that kind of a configuration so that's what i'm adding now here uh, just one more rule. So this would need a separate rule than uh, slash catalog also. So it's going to pass it to the same server, but this time it's slash API products and everything that follows. And it goes to the same configuration or same server, but the catalog server, but slash API products, a different path. So now it knows how to handle it. So 
if I go back now and uh, look at this, this does work. And as a result of that, what <laughs> you're going to notice is not only does this work, but also if I go to the front end, it is able to, because this is built-in configuration, which says localhost slash API products, look at that. Uh, so it loads that automatically already, right? And I can go further and uh, add a configuration to catalog. I have not added explicitly. So I can go to front end configuration, OPT front end uh, for the crafty stuff. And here there is config.json, which can say uh, this catalog service is not on this catalog host, but just localhost slash catalog that goes it goes to nginx of course and uh, restart the front end now you see the catalog being up so it is able to connect to catalog catalog was already loading and that works no problems so now I have ways to uh, not only access, so uh, external user also, right? If you want to provide, now this is not mandatory, but if you want to provide access to this uh, service for the external users, uh, not just via front end, but direct access to this also, the user can say, hey, Nginx IP slash catalog and can access this backend service altogether. Right? And that's the configuration that I've demonstrated here. Why I have taken this project again is purely to show you how Nginx works. This is how traditionally, uh, if you have a legacy configuration, this is something that you may have. Uh, this introduces a lot of complexity though, because you have to keep track of essentially all these services that we have added to the Nginx or have some other mechanism for keeping track of which servers are available, which servers are current. In the world of containers, it's constantly changing. In the world of containers, again, you can use a domain name or a source name here, of course, but otherwise you'll have to keep track of this, keep on updating it. This is why we had this configuration management tools like Chef and Puppet and Ansible which used to dynamically update it based on oh what is currently available and all of that. And that was the time when, um, you know, we could use configuration management to keep track of. And that's why configuration management tools were so significant because all these problems uh, could have been solved with those tools as well. So you can use those tools, but still it's introducing a, a single point of failure here. Uh, so it is not an ideal uh, kind of a setup that we use. And again, we wanted to try and minimize it and show you how things work with reverse proxy, Nginx configurations, uh, SSH routing, and uh, NAT gateways and all that. Of course, in a production environment, you can create a more sophisticated uh, setup with a dedicated NAT gateway, multiple instances of front-end, back-end, and then instead of using this, set up a VPN access also. And... Um, SSH multi-hop is still usable everywhere. And instead of Nginx, you can also replace it with something like a load balancer and maybe target group autoscaler as well. Maybe that's what we will take up in the next mission. So again, this kind of a bootcamp or a cohort is evolving. And uh, uh, in the next one, I'm just still thinking, I'm thinking of one is bringing up the one more backing service, either a cards or recommendation, and then adding the component where we configure this as a uh, cloud specific, high available, scalable configuration, where we talk about <laughs> target groups, load balancers, autoscaler, and create a high available, scalable uh, configuration, all integrated with AWS. But we wanted to take a detour, talk about Linux networking, Nginx, and uh, that's why this mission. Right, so... Uh, uh, Gauru, just one question on the last part, config.json. Hmm. Uh, where you changed something and the... the that is a configuration for front-end. 
Oh, okay. So yeah. even if you don't have, let's say even if you did not have an Nginx at all, right? Even then, how would you con uh, talk to the backend service from frontend and other services? Because frontend uses server-side renting, as I told you. For this application, all these services are handled by the front end itself, like the voting application recommendation, and it uh, routes the request to those services, loads it from there. We are using a server side renting uh, setup where, which is much more simpler for us. We don't have to expose everything to the outside world at all. Uh, so how does that work is the front end has to have connection to these uh, services, including the recommendation voting and the catalog. How does it do that? Is it uses these three URLs. Product is the catalog service. Recommendation is a separate service. Uh, voting is a third service. And the front end will connect to each of this service. This can be, actually, this can be, and in a real, uh, in a typical scenario, I would have set this configure.json just to. Uh, I used it because we have Nginx, this path. Otherwise, it would have been just this at 5,000. 5,000 port uh, is the one for backend, yes. And that's what I would have used uh, to configure my catalog service here. Because that is the actual IP of it. <laughs> and uh, it would work the same. So that would basically mean it is connecting directly, not via Nginx. This is connect connecting directly to that backend service. Now. Okay, so and we, we mentioned that local host, right? Uh, so, but uh, the thing is, the front end is actually running on an EC2, and the back end is actually running on an EC2. Nothing is running in our local. Yeah, yeah. Local host is, uh, see, uh, local host is with respect to where we have configured. The front end is running here. The local host for front end is the same server, which is where Nginx is running. So, when I said local host catalog, it was going via Nginx. Okay, okay. Because, now because Nginx is actually running on uh, same server, front end, front end server. Yeah, yeah, because we're just optimizing it for cost and everything here, yeah. right? So most of you, I would assume, would be using free tier. So you don't want to create like 10 different services or servers. So that's why we are keeping it uh, optimized in terms of clubbing it all together. Yeah. All right, so okay. we will get a better products. understanding only when we implement this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Gaurav, quick question. Like uh, last week, we had problem with the Postgres, right? So is it, uh, where do you get the code from the GitHub? You already fixed it, you said, right? It's there in the repository. So I'll awesome. show you. So I had set up a, so right now you see all these products are being loaded from a JSON file. Uh, I will connect it to database and show you. So the code is already there, the same repository. Okay. Uh, Got you it. can okay. see it's the same repo. So it just, if you add the configuration, now it works. Earlier it was not working, now it works. That's the only difference. Yeah, you just have to change the config so that it can connect to database. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the, yeah, this is what I committed last week. And uh, it's just some, I think it was just, it needed some backslashes to escape certain uh, com, you know, colons and all, because otherwise it was considering it as the end of it. And then it was thinking that this is the next code and all that. So I just had to fix a few things, that's it. And that works okay. now. So if you provide the database configuration here uh, and run this script, it creates the table. And then subsequently you can um, just configure the application uh, in catalog, I think it's catalog. If you configure it here in uh, config.json for the catalog, provide the database details, change it to DB, uh, it starts working. Yeah. So that could okay. work. Yeah. And also, can you, if you have time, like, can you show us like um, how to configure SSL also for Nginx, like uh, certif installing certificate and uh, async? So that rest. would take a pretty long right. time, uh, okay. not right now. So okay. what I would suggest also what happens with SSL is you need a domain name uh, okay. for SSL to work. So that's why I've not taken that uh, specifically unless we can, if you guys find a free hosting service or domain name service that everybody can register, 
let me know we can take that up so what you will do is use let's encrypt to create a certificate <laughs> because let's encrypt gives you free certificates which is a great thing to have and uh, but you need a domain name for uh, having a certificate any domain name is fine so find out a domain name and then create a certificate and add it to the config uh, here that's what you'll have to do uh, it'll be just some other config but you'll have the creating the certificate will take time mainly you need domains and all that dependencies there so that's why i have not taken it up so let's see if we have a uh, time and if that fits into our use case because i was thinking to move to alb really uh, where we can add uh, uh, the same configuration and stuff but let's see if we can take up the uh, tls or something we can uh, it's still evolving our use case so we'll yeah. see what can be accommodated yeah not a problem if you if you have time at the end so sure. not a big All right, so recording, I'm going to publish it to the YouTube channel, plus it'll be part of our um, portal. The lab guides will definitely be part of our portal. So uh, that DevOps cohort course that I've created, a uh, cloud ops cohort, it will be part of that. For those of you who are not yet members, you may want to uh, consider getting the nerd membership, which will give you access to that cloud ops and everything else also for now, right? And uh, the recordings will definitely be available uh, on the portal as well as on YouTube. I'll have it be available by tomorrow, along with all these uh, uh, documents and the guides, uh, reference code and the solutions uh, that I will upload to the same portal as well. All right. So with that, uh, we'll conclude the session for today. I hope it was interesting for you. And uh, do let me know what kind of projects you would like to see as well. And we'll try to incorporate uh, whatever is possible for the use case. And uh, we'll, we have still three weeks to go. So uh, we'll pick up the use cases and uh, see how this can be evolved further. Uh, auto scaling, definitely load balancer auto scaling is something I'm definitely thinking about. Apart from that, um, what else do you think useful? Uh, we'll figure it out. Maybe scripting. Maybe Terraform is what I'm still thinking, but uh, let's see how it evolves from here on. We still have three missions uh, that we can build from here. All right, so thank you. And uh, I will see you next week with uh, yet another mission. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Gaurav. And uh, yeah. Gaurav, if possible, if, uh, like, if some throwing some light on Python, Boto3 will also be uh, helpful. Okay. From let's the scripting see. point of view. So Python border three to connect to AWS and automate stuff, is it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Yeah. I've noted. Sure. sure. Thank right. you. Thanks, Carol. Thank you. And bye -bye. Uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks, Carol.